Hi, I'm Commissioner Rob Gelder, and welcome to this episode of Commissioner's Corners. Today we're on board the Rich Passage 1. Today we're going to be talking about all things passenger-only ferry, so welcome aboard and stay tuned to learn more. Hello and welcome to this episode of Commissioner's Corner. Uh, you'll notice that the, the background today is a little bit different than a studio. We're actually on the Rich Passage 1 right now. So if you see the background behind us moving a little bit, just know that we're rocking and rolling with the incoming ferries going back and forth across from uh, Bremerton to Port Orchard. But joining me today is John Clausen, the Executive Director of Kitsap Transit, and we're going to talk about all things passenger ferries. So, John, thank you so much for being here today. I very much appreciate uh, it. My pleasure. And I think for, as a st way of starting off, it would probably be helpful if we could, if you could share a little bit of, from your knowledge uh, about personal uh, passenger-only ferries, really, in that service within Kitsap County. Well, passenger ferries have actually been serving Kitsap County in some form or another for a number of years. Uh, as a lot of people will recognize the Mosquito Fleet era, mm -hmm. uh, during that time there was something like 40 different docks along the shorelines of Kitsap County, that that was really the main means of transportation uh, before roads. Uh, Kitsap County was ironically connected with Seattle with that fleet. In fact, uh, a lot of times people that had produce or uh, uh, different types of goods that w they wanted to take to Seattle, they'd have to use a mosquito fleet to get there to sell their goods. So, uh, And then over the years, there's been a number of attempts uh, with passenger-only program. Uh, we have an operation currently that runs between Port Orchard and Bremerton. That has been in operation for a number of years, uh, actually back before the war. Uh, it was an operation that's been in continuous operation during that period. So passenger ferry boats have been part of Kitsap County for years. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, probably one of the more recent passenger only at least services between Bremerton and uh, Seattle. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the, the time when the state ferry system had a passenger only boat. Um, and obviously that had um, consequences that folks didn't necessarily anticipate in terms of the the shoreline through Rich Passage, et cetera. So a lot of time and energy has gone into designing and testing the, the boat and the vessel that we're actually sitting on. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about that? How did that all come about that we are now have this vessel that we're sitting on? Well, as you had mentioned, the property owners along Rich Passage were noticing uh, a lot of damage to their beaches and bulkheads uh, when the state was operating their service and in fact, uh, the state actually slowed down their operation uh, to help mitigate some of the issues that the vessels were causing along the beaches. Uh, consequently, there was no time advantage to the, to the program at that point. Uh, and then a number of things happened to where the, the legislature finally decided that they were going to get out of the passenger only business. Well, just before they were going to get out of the business, the state actually started a process to study wakes in Rich Passage. Mm to try to determine you know, to what extent there was truly damage because of the vessels and if there was a vessel that could possibly operate through there without causing the, the impact. Well, when the legislature decided that the state should get out of the passenger ferry business, WSF actually came to Kitsap Transit and asked us if we would pick up uh, the torch, if you will, on that study. and. Fortunately, along with that came a lot of federal funding to help mm -hmm. pay for that. So over the last close to 10 years, uh, we've had scientists out through Rich Passage studying the beaches and the impacts of not only vessel wakes, but wind waves, seasonal variations that would occur, just the normal uh, things that would happen and affect the, the beaches. Towards the latter part of that study, they also started to look at vessel designs to try to find what's the best vessel out there uh, that could operate high speed to Seattle without having major effects on the, on the beaches in Rich Passage. 
Uh, we looked at hovercrafts, mm -hmm. um, virtually no wake, extremely noisy, and not very fuel efficient. Uh, they don't really have the capacity either, so that was kind of discounted. There has been some testing done on hydrofoils, true hydrofoils, but that had challenges as well. So in the standard, if you will, off-the-shelf uh, vessel designs, we started looking at uh, basically catamarans. We found a vessel that had the lowest wake profile, and then they took that design. Scientists went back to some supercomputers and kind of tweaked the hull design. Mm -hmm to come up with a design that was the most efficient as far as speed and low wakes. Uh, and basically from there, we were able to get a federal grant that helped build the vessel that we're on today. Now this vessel was built uh, with a lot of extra things in it, specifically to help during the test period. There's a lot of instruments in the vessel itself that we could measure what was going on with the boat while it was in the test phase. But it was also designed with weight in mind. The more, the heavier the vessel is, the greater the wake. Mm -hmm. So this particular vessel was designed with such things as basically everything from this main deck up is all carbon fiber. So it's a very light weight vessel. Uh, and consequently, this uh, vessel was constructed and tested and it has, um, beyond doubt the best wake profile of any vessel that we've been able to find. Then this vessel was the one that we used, uh, I think it was in the latter part of 2012, that we actually put the vessel into operation carrying passengers while the scientists watched the be uh, beaches and measured uh, the wake impact from this particular vessel and came up with their their final recommendation which is we now have a vessel that we know we can operate high speed to Seattle without having uh, the negative effects of rich passage. And I would imagine those learnings can be applied to many other places in the world that have those types of channels that are fairly mm -hmm. restricted. And uh, so, I mean, I'm sure that can be shared. And Oh, it is. It, it already has been. In mm -hmm. fact, the scientists that have uh, developed all of this data and, and developed the work have actually shared that uh, literally throughout the world. Um, I know I was told that uh, former Governor Gregoire was in Australia when one of the scientists was presenting there and she didn't realize that some of the worldwide experts on Wake was right here uh, in the Puget Sound. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. What I've always found interesting is that it's actually, and, and I'm definitely not an engineer, but the fact that in order to lessen the Wake you go faster. Mm -hmm. um, can you <coughs> tell us a little bit about sort of that that design and sort of the approach to the operation through Rich Passage? One of the unique things about this vessel is, as I mentioned, it's a catamaran. It has two hulls, but in between the hulls is actually a wing. Um, and we're able to adjust the pitch of that wing slightly as it's in operation. And as you go faster, that wing has a tendency to pick a little bit more of the hull up out of the, now it doesn't come out of the water, mm -hmm. but the profile that's in the water lessens when you go higher speeds. So uh, that's one of the things that makes this vessel such a, a great boat for low wake. But it is kind of an interesting dynamic when we're in operation because we actually have to speed up when we go through rich passage and mm -hmm. then when we get out the other side we slow down to get into more of an, a, a fuel economy type of operation. Okay. So after the time that it took to design it, build it, test it, and realize that it worked. Mm -hmm. um, now I think then the conversation really turned to, well, what do you do with it? What's the uh, possible application? And how could uh, a passenger-only ferry service be reestablished from Bremerton and other communities over to Seattle? So can you tell us a little bit about the, the work that happened next relative to looking at the, sort of the, the business planning and that study that went into that? Well, fortunately after our test we actually had some federal funds uh, uh, remaining and we asked the Federal Transit Administration for permission to be able to use the funds to develop a business plan. Now that we know that we can operate high speed to Seattle without having the envir environmental impacts, mm -hmm. Uh, we then brought in a team of experts that looked at a number of different aspects in the development of a business plan. 
we looked at such things as, well, first off, kind of what does the community, what would they like to see as far as the frequency of operation? Uh, what would the cost be? What would the vessels need to look like? Uh, what are the different routes that, that uh, would make sense, uh, would be viable from a ridership standpoint? Mm -hmm. uh, we came down to basically three routes, uh, Kingston to Seattle, Bremerton to Seattle, and Southworth to Seattle. Both of them have a ridership profile that would, um, you could justify the operation. We then looked at other things like what would the docking requirements be, what kind of investment would we need to make in docks in all three locations. Sure. And it ranges from things like here in Bremerton, all we would need is some signage. Uh, Kingston, we'd need to make some moderate improvements to the facilities there. And Southworth, we'd have to build a whole new dock since there's nothing available in that area. Right. And then we went through and looked at the costs, phasing in, how long would it take us to get enough vessels to operate the service? What would we look at in way of cost? Uh, what would it cost to operate? What are the different models of operation, whether we should operate it directly or whether we should contract the operation out? What some of those costs would look like? And then we try to determine some of the economic benefits to the community. So, and I'm glad you, you brought up the economic benefits. I think that's one of the, the things that interests me most about the study itself mm -hmm. and the business model is looking at sort of the radius of impact of economic, um, the ec economic vitality that sort of could potentially be felt mm -hmm. by the establishment of those routes. And I think that uh, it's kind of an interesting concept in terms of what it does to housing values, um, but just <coughs> how it opens up the market in, mm -hmm. in a different way that doesn't otherwise exist or doesn't currently exist. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that's a powerful uh, message and, and takeaway from that Very study. Very much so. Very much so. And I think the same could be said for it, the connections around any of our ferry communities. They are served. They're a connection to the I-5 corridor, et cetera, um, which would be great. Getting back to the, the cost, the cost kind of piece of it and mm -hmm. what are the funding streams for a passenger only ferry service. Um, you know, we've all seen letters to the editor lately that have said, you know, we shouldn't do it. It's, you know, subsidizing uh, a small number of people making that connection. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Sort of what, how much are our current bus services subsidized? Mm -hmm. Maybe even our current foot ferry service? between Bremerton and, and Port Orchard. I think it's good to kind of have a, a sense of what that looks like in comparison. Just to put things kind of in perspective in regards to that, uh, right now Kitsap Transit overall for the system, uh, about 20% of our cost of operation is derived out of the fare box. Okay. So that 20% number is actually a pretty good number for a transit system. Uh, in the passenger ferry operations, it's a little bit better, uh, not a lot. Uh, in places like Manhattan, where they have lots of uh, passenger ferries, they're probably in excess of 50, 60 percent. I'm not aware of any that derive 100 percent of their cost of operating from their fare box, as mm -hmm. we refer to it. King County right now, I think, is uh, right around the 30-plus range. Uh, in our modeling that we did when we developed the business plan, we were looking at what the fare box recovery ratio would look like uh, uh, for our for an operation of these three routes, and when we get all three routes in operation, we're anticipating that we would be in that 38 percent range. Uh, uh, again, this type of an operation, like the bus system, uh, needs to be subsidized. Mm -hmm. As I said, I'm not aware of any of them that can actually pay for their entire operation from fares alone. And I know that, well, the Washington State ferry system, <coughs> I, mean, I think the, the stat that's thrown about is about 70% fare box recovery, mm -hmm. but that's a different system and that's riders and cars, and yeah. there's a heavy amount of subsidy within certain routes. Um, well, it is, and they also derive a tremendous amount of that revenue from the vehicles uh, because that's where their, if you will, bread butter is mm -hmm. for uh, their fare box. <coughs> and, and you made a great point. I think that you know, there's subsidies that happen across any transit system. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the investment of those subsidies helps to shift some of the costs that otherwise would be needed in road projects because of issues of capacity mm -hmm. and, and maintenance and that ongoing operation. 
There was a, a recent study that took place or an article about the ferry system in New York um, mm -hmm. and serving the boroughs around there. And someone, the, the author of that study, I thought was quite interesting. They were looking at um, almost really what, what's the role of ferries and is it not duplicative of other services that currently exist? And the conclusion was it actually helps support a much more holistic approach to transportation mm -hmm. and that it provided redundancies um, it, because that was important in order to make sure that the, the system worked overall. Mm -hmm. People needed to have choice. It wasn't all born on, it wasn't an elitist type. The ferry service was not about serving mm -hmm. um, the, the wealthy, but mm -hmm. it was really about creating connectivity in the community. Exactly, and, I, and probably a good analogy for the Puget Sound, I, I know a lot of people have been watching the construction of the light rail system in King County and mm -hmm. what Sound Transit is doing and, and how well it's being utilized. And I guess I look at this as this would be the equivalent of our light rail system. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we don't have to dig tunnels, we don't have to lay track, those kind of very expensive things that come along with a, a high capacity transit system. But uh, this could be the Kitsap County's high capacity transit. Mm -hmm. Well, someday we'll do a um, another program about bus rapid transit there you and, go. and that, that type of thing good. too, because I that's another topic that mm -hmm. I'm very much interested in. But, but I think that uh, going back to the uh, sort of the operation, if if this comes to be uh, and we're able to have a passenger only ferry service, one of the recommendations from the study was creating a public public partnership right. to make it happen. Could you mm -hmm. explain a little bit more about what those recommendations are? Well, essentially we looked at the different types of operations. Of course, you know, the most logical that people would assume is, well, we're going to operate it directly. Mm -hmm. um, we looked at that as an option and what it would cost. We looked at maybe we should just contract the whole thing out to a private operator. Similarly to what we do with our Fort Orchard Department and Service, it's actually the boats are driven by a private contractor. Okay. We own the vessels and the service but it's operated by a private contractor. We also looked at the possibility of a public public partnership, which in this case made the most sense. Uh, King County has a passenger ferry operation going today. They operate vessels from downtown to West Seattle and downtown to Vashon Island. Kay. They also just invested quite a bit of money into a uh, fairly new maintenance facility, an on-water maintenance facility. So it would probably make more sense for us to contract with King County to operate the vessels for us. Now, it, they would be under our control. They'd be our boats. You, as a board member of Kitsap Transit, would be responsible for setting the fares, setting the schedules, things of that nature. We would just contract with them to provide the crews to operate the vessels. Okay. That's helpful. I think that's... Um, it. it People assume your logo's on it, that you're doing everything from soup to nuts, but when you can actually um, contract that out to an entity that has current experience and capacity, exactly. it can kind of help with the overall operating cost. Well, it, you know, it really doesn't so. make sense for us to set up a management system and all the things that go along with hiring. You know, this is kind of a unique operation, mm -hmm. so you'd have a, a special group of employees. When King County already has that, if you will, infrastructure in place, so. Right we would work with them to just come up with an operating contract. Okay, uh, makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I, so I'm going to ask you to go out on a limb a little bit okay. on this next kind of line of questioning. And, and but that gets back to, <coughs> we already have um, basically a remnant route of the Mosquito Fleet between mm -hmm. Bremerton and Port Orchard. Mm -hmm. um, two connections to Port Orchard basically. Um, and I know there's been some conversations over the, you know, how do we move people around the community? That whether there's a talk of, you know, let's, you know, borrow Bertha and bore a hole through, <laughs> you know, Bainbridge Island or whatever the case may be. My mm -hmm. apologies to our viewers from Bainbridge. Um, there's there's no plans on, in that regard, but it's Thank it's you. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting the sort of the ideas that people put out there. You know, more bridges, et cetera, but. Mm -hmm. I think th the power of a passenger-only ferry system is, as we are struggling in the legislature now mm -hmm. to establish a transportation budget, uh, there's, it's been a while since we've had one. If we get one this year, it'll be a long time before we get another one. Yeah. 
and our all of our communities are growing in terms of population mm -hmm. and we need to be able to move people goods and services around so how do we do that in an effective way and so we look at sort of well what role maybe what is what was old is is new or mm -hmm. comes back mm -hmm. in terms of the mosquito fleet uh, so my this has been a roundabout way of getting to the question about sure. what do you think of the possibilities of kind of a resurrection or revival of a, the concept of a mosquito fleet where we're connecting as a county with over 300 miles of shoreline mm -hmm. we're interconnecting our communities in different ways that don't require um, road systems right, to do right. that. I think it's a very viable option that that we could look to to the future and let me put it this way, um, we look at our ferry service between Bremerton and Port Orchard as a bus route. Mm -hmm. It is the most cost effective and most efficient bus route we have in our system. So when you can provide that kind of efficiency to other parts of our community, whether it be from Suquamish to Bremerton or wherever, mm -hmm. um, I think you could do it very, very efficiently and, uh, you know, I think bringing the old back new is probably a viable option. Yeah. So, and you reminded me of another point that um, I think if if the passenger only ferry service is created within uh, Kitsap County, and we talk about mm -hmm. the existing service between Bremerton and Port Orchard, yes. but that service is funded out of the, the same way that the same funding sources that our current bus service, because you mentioned Correct. it is treated like a bus line. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So what would the benefit of the creation of a ferry service, ferry district, would that allow then the cost of that current passenger only ferry service between those two communities to be shifted and thus increasing capacity within the bus system? It would, you know, it's kind of interesting when we looked at pricing out the cost of a cross sound passenger ferry system. It falls in between probably one-tenth on the sales tax, if we were looking at sales tax exclusively. Between one-tenth and two-tenths, not quite up to two-tenths. Well, unfortunately, we can't go out to the voters and ask for one and a half or something like that. So if we were to go with a two-tenth issue, that would provide sufficient funding that we could move the passenger ferry operation between Portage and Bremerton into that funding source. And as you had indicated, it's now being funded by the transit system that would free up uh, approximately a million dollars a year that we could use to enhance the bus system mm -hmm. and expand its operation. Okay, so since we're talking about buses a little bit, I'll, I'll diverge um, from passenger only ferry service. So something new that's uh, recently launched in um, City of Paulsbo is, mm -hmm. is a new route there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, can you, mention a little bit about sort of how that really, it's, it's more of a, for those of who aren't familiar, it's, it's basically a circular route that continues to, to loop the city mm -hmm. and some key components of it. It's, it's pretty recent. Any um, feedback or findings on how that's doing? Well, it's pretty early to really make a deter uh, determination on its effectiveness, but it is essentially a circular route that is designed to be able to operate on a 30-minute, what we call headway. So every 30 minutes the bus is going around in a circle. So it makes a much more frequent connection to some of the key points within the city like Olympic College or some of those shopping areas. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, people are seeing to, to head towards it. They're kind of liking that concept. Mm -hmm. We left the existing route in place so that people could kind of figure out which one's going to work the best for them. Um, but it does appear to be pretty successful. And I know that uh, the city of Palsbo is very interested in uh, its operation. In fact, I understand talking with Mayor Erickson that their council just approved a, a marketing contract uh, to help market that particular bus within their city. So I, I hope and expect it to really do well. So does that mean <coughs> Captain Kitsap will be making an appearance <laughs> in Palsbo? Well, it's entirely possible, but we were kind of joking this morning that we may have to put some horns on Captain Kitsap's head yes, if it goes to, to Paul's With the Viking attire, yes. yes. For those of you that are, have not seen any of the marketing uh, spots for the worker driver bus service mm -hmm. uh, that serves the naval base Kitsap, um, it uh, will definitely make sure that we get you links, et, et cetera, to see some of those mm -hmm. um, spots. But uh, there's always confusion. Is, is uh, Mr. Claussen actually 
the uh, the stand-in for Captain no, Kitsap. No, no, unfortunately my profile just didn't fit the need, so. <laughs> <coughs> so one of the things too, when we sort of circling back to the, the passenger only ferry service is that, as, as I understand it really for a transit service to work, you have to have the frequency, the convenience, and, and really the reliability. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the, the challenges and the experiments that have happened with passenger only ferry service in our county in the not too distant past, it was really uh, struggled with the reliability and that, that really hurt mm -hmm. the ridership. And, and so I know that some of the, the questions or concerns that have come up about the business plan and business model was mm -hmm. looking at the, the number of vessels that you would need to have but I think the number of vessels really ties into that reliability and the, the ability to have backups, as exactly. we all know from our current experience with the ferry system, mm -hmm. the state ferry system. I exactly, and that, that's a big challenge to make sure that you can provide reliable service because mm -hmm. people, before they want to change their method of commute, want to make sure that they can depend on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so in our plan, we've identified the the number of spare vessels we would need to be able to provide that reliable service. One of the advantages of having three routes though is that we can share spare vessels. We okay. don't necessarily need to have a spare on each particular route. We're close enough that we can get a vessel in place uh, when need be rather quickly. So. That, that would be good. Yeah. Um, so redundancy is important. Redundancy is important. Now we are kind of, um, we need different types of vessels. Uh, we need similar vessels to what we're sitting on today for the service between Bremerton and Seattle because of Rich Passage. Uh, we wouldn't need quite uh, this high-tech vessel for, say, southward to downtown. But this vessel could certainly fall in as a spare for the service between Bremerton, or excuse me, Southworth and Seattle if we needed it. Okay. So well, I guess one, maybe one last thought, one question is about, I think really to, in making it work, it's sort of all of those, those handoffs. It's that intermodal connectivity that we have. I think <coughs> we have a certain responsibility in the county that interface between our bus service as well as the passenger only ferry or the, the ferry service. Yes. Um, but on the other side, if we were to expand the service into King County, mm -hmm. basically, and make those connections, what's, what's the working relationship with those other uh, transit providers on the other side of the water that would help to facilitate that connectivity so that people can continue moving? Well, we work monthly with uh, King County Metro in particular for downtown Seattle as far as the bus operation. Um, all the general managers of the transit systems in the Puget Sound get together once a month and we talk about whatever issues that are uh, common to each of us. So that would be where we would start to try to improve the connectivity. Also another thing that would help us of course is if we were to have King County as the operator of it, there's another connection that we would have in place and certainly that would help for the coordination of vessels coming and going from the dock itself in, in Seattle. And then too, we also, we're all working very well together and frequently talk to each other, including Washington State Ferries. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking with Washington State Ferries as a group, not specifically Kitsap, uh, about the future design of the passenger ferry facility at Coleman Dock, as well as what they're planning to do with the improvements that they're uh, working on in Coleman, so. Okay. There's, there's a communication link already in place that we would certainly depend on. Wonderful. <coughs> I'm glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. Um, I, we could spend a lot more time talking about this topic, but many other topics uh, around transit and transit issues. And so hopefully you'll consider coming back to a, a another program that we have Absolutely. Uh, in the future. But I want to thank everyone for taking the time to watch this episode of Commissioner Corner uh, with uh, Executive Director of Kitsap Transit, John Clausen, and talking about passenger-only ferry service. I think there's uh, more of a conversation to be had in our community in the coming months as we continue to, to see whether or not and how passenger-only ferry service works for the Kitsap community in connecting us to the, the greater I-5 corridor. So please be part of that conversation as we move forward, and thank you for watching. <laughs>